Good afternoon. My name is Bill Mullen. I'm the Executive Director for the Lower Savannah Council of Governments in Aiken, South Carolina. And I want to uh, thank NATO for the opportunity to serve as a moderator today for this session called Cybersecurity and Changing Workplace Environment, which is provided by generous support of VC3, which is based in uh, North and South Carolina. Across the nation, many of our organizations, along with businesses throughout our region, have been challenged in new ways since COVID-19 global pandemic was declared by the World Health Organization back on March 11th. Um, with stay-at-home orders in place, a number of RDOs were suddenly forced to develop policies and procedures for staff um, that would be working remotely um, from home. In addition, they were also struggling to make uh, sure that staff had the adequate technology to actually work outside the office. And um, added to that, the normal concerns about cybersecurity and the past several months have not been easy for most of us. Um, like many organizations prior to the pandemic, Lower Savannah Council of Governments, um, the COG operated with mostly its staff working in the office and using our desktop computers. Thankfully, our IT contractor, VC3, um, prior to the pandemic, had all of our staff members um, working on the Citrix system um, that allowed for a safe and secure access from anywhere. And I don't know about you all, but um, I use um, my home computer all the time to uh, log in and check on work at all different times of the day and on the weekend and that kind of stuff. Um, in mid late March, we were like everyone else. We were scrambling to get staff all the hardware that we needed, laptops and Surface Pros. Surface Pros were especially useful in, with staff who were in rural areas. Um, and so we wanted to make sure everybody was able to work from home. Um, our governor in the beginning of April put, to, put in a, a home and work order um, for the state so that for us, all non-essential staff members were working from home and connecting to the office through the cloud and the uh, VC3 Citrix platform. Once we had the hardware in place, there were still some issues. Um, as you remember, Zoom had some issues in regard to some of the security and the firewall issues that we had following that. MS Teams really didn't work for us, and I know a lot of other people. But the biggest issue we had was getting staff <clears throat> to understand how to use the new hardware and how to connect to the server. This was readily taken care of in the first couple of days, and we had everybody successfully working from home. In the middle of the summer, we brought back our staff, about half um, our staff in the office working, um, and the rest of the half the time working from home. And this month, we went to 75% of our staff working in the office with the remainder of home as well. This has created some issues um, along, uh, along the way because um, our office hardware had not caught up to our virtual, uh, the virtual life that we are living right now. Um, however, we're working through this as well and that's seemed to be getting along working with um, platforms like GoToMeeting kind of stuff. Um, so today, um, our speaker is Mr. Joe Holland. He is the Chief Information Security Officer with VC3. VC3 has been involved in NATO's annual conference for the past decade, um, and many of us have worked with VC3. Um, my own organization has been working with VC3 for the last six or seven years. And so I'm pleased to introduce Joe. Um, real quickly, Joe has worked in the IT industry for over 20 years and has an extensive IT management experience spanning multiple industries. He's a graduate of UCLA with a degree in mathematics computation with a computer specialization. Uh, Joe joined VC3 back in 2009 and during his time with VC3, Joe has performed in the role of the virtual CIO um, for some of VC3's largest governmental customers and Joe is currently VC3's Chief Information Security Officer um, and is responsible for VC3's IT security as well as um, advising on security for VC3 customers. Um, before we start, if you have any questions during his presentation, please write them in the question box on your screen um, and we will have probably about five minutes at the end of this session for Q&A. That being said, I am pleased to welcome Joe Holland. Joe, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you very much, Bill. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm happy to have the opportunity to present this topic. 
Um, it is important to me, uh, like most of the organizations that are probably on here eight months ago, VC3 sent everybody home and we had some of these same challenges. Okay, we're used to having all of our employees in a central location, in a central office, and we want them to work and now they're all home. Um, you know, how do we do that effectively? Uh, like Bill, we had systems in place previously that, that really enabled and facilitated that remote work model. So for us, it was less about the technology and more about just making sure we we were secure, uh, that we were we were adjusting to this new world. Uh, but we had lots of clients that were in that place of, OK, what do we do now? What technologies do we need to put in place? How do we do this? Um, so there was a big scramble to really help our, our clients move to that remote work model. And as we've seen, as we've seen over the past eight months, a lot of organizations that we are dealing with are, are telling us now, we're never going to go back or we're going to go back partially or we're always going to, we're, we found out that we can do this remote work effectively so now we're going to embrace that we're going to go give our employees the option of working from home rather than saying okay everybody's got, got to go about back to the office once the pandemic's over so we really can expect for many organizations this is going to be a long-term issue that we've got to start looking at not just in a reactive mode but really what do we need to be thinking about as next steps and really planning for the future um, so i'm happy to be talking about this i think it's a great topic and I think it will, hopefully this will serve all of you well going into the future. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about real quickly here, um, I, I hate to throw the scary security statistics out there, uh, but they, they are important to understand. Why is security important? And that number one bullet there, uh, it is expected that organizations will have spent $6 trillion in reactive costs around cybercrime by the end of 2021. So that is not money being spent on your security solution, on your preventative measures um, to have security. This is strictly money being spent in response to breaches, in response to incidents, in response to ransomware. That is a, an astounding, astounding figure. And I mean, that's economies. <laughs> that's national economies in many parts of the world. So that, that is a huge number. Um, Secondly, we want our customers to have confidence in us. We want our the, citizen, the cities that are in our regions to have confidence in us. We want our citizens to have confidence in us. Anybody we are dealing with, we want them to have confidence with us. Uh, Three billion PII records were stolen last year. PII is personally identifiable information. So that's your social security numbers, your address, your email, anything that can, can identify you as a specific individual is considered PII. Three billion PII records stolen last year. That, that is a lot of information about us that is floating around on the internet, most of it for sale. And then finally, we really have got to work on protecting our employees. Uh, we have seen a real uptick in payroll attacks over the past year. And I'm actually going to give a specific example of one of these later in the presentation. But, but it's not just about our organizations and our clients and our customers. Yes, those are important. Yes, we want to protect our organization. Yes, we want to protect our clients as well. But we want to protect our employees. And, and there's nothing worse than getting a call from your employee saying, why didn't I get paid this week because you moved money to a new account that they didn't authorize. Um, and we're seeing those types of accounts, all attacks all over the place. So, so let's, let's protect our employees as well because this is impacting their wallets. All right, um, why is home different? Why is it so important for us to think about this as we, um, as we move home? Well, most organizations have these very carefully constructed security boundaries. Right? We put in these enterprise grade or commercial grade firewalls and we've got antivirus software and anti-spam solutions and we're patching our systems and we've got all of these systems in place that are designed to keep our organization secure. Well, as soon as my, my employee moves to their home computer, They've moved entirely outside of many of those protective boundaries we have created for them. So, so that's significant. We've got to be adjusting to that. We've got to be looking at how does that impact the security of my environment? What do I need to be doing differently? And we're going to talk about that. Um, they're often working on shared computers. You know, in my house, we have one family computer. I use it. My wife uses it. My kids use it. 
So the same computer that I might get on and log into work at from, or you know, check my email from, or just browse the internet on, it's the same computer my kids are looking for free games to play and downloading stuff. And right, so it is, it is not a secure environment at all. And many of us, when we're working from home, are in those same situations. We, we're on shared computers with, with lots of different uses, and there's nothing wrong with those uses. But again, it ups the security risk. Um, and we have definitely seen a, a acknowledgement and recognition by the malicious actors out there that the world is different and they are trying to take advantage of it. Uh, the, the increase in attacks that are targeting specifically COVID type language and COVID type information has gone up dramatically and we're seeing people fall for it. We're seeing the, the attackers understand, hey, these people are running on home PCs. If I can get a foothold on their home PC, no, I'm not in their network, but it gets me a lot closer to getting in their network. So organizations are getting breached through their employees' home PCs because the world is working that way now. And the attackers know this and they're taking advantage of it. So we've got to adjust our thinking and we've got to think about how we can apply additional layers of security. All right, um, if you have never seen this little chart here, I'm gonna talk through it very quickly. Um, and this really, this is a, the NIST cybersecurity framework. The NIST is the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Uh, there's a link at this bottom of the slide that'll go give you all the information around this framework and what it is and how you can implement these things. But the design here, the, the idea here is, this is a great framework to that any organization should be looking at when they apply their security. Um, and there's really five parts to this framework and I'll talk through them quickly. Um, it really starts with that blue pot piece of the pie up at the top right that says identify. And that simply is we've got to identify what it is we want to protect. Our assets, our data, our employees, we've got to know what's in our environment that is needs to be protected then we need to protect it right and that's antivirus and patching and firewalls that pie right there that purple part of the pie that's where most organizations camp out and live most organizations don't do any of the rest of these pieces they certainly don't identify they just throw a firewall in they put antivirus everywhere they patch everything and they just say we're just going to protect everything they don't really put thought into where is my critical data? Where is my critical information? What are they, what are, where are my vulnerable areas that may need additional protection? They just put the same protection across everything. Not bad, it's a great starting point. Um, so I don't want to, to criticize anybody for doing that, but I really do encourage you to look at the other pieces of this pie if that's what you've done. Uh, moving into the tech detect section, this is really where I spend a lot of time on education with BC3 clients. This is really where I want to move the organizations that we support. It's great to have that protection, those protective uh, mechanisms and technologies out there, but we have got to have the detection in place as well. And detection simply is are the, the tools that are going to allow us to see if something is amiss. It's one thing to have antivirus in place, and maybe your antivirus is working really well and it's cleaning out infections as they come in. But if you never see those infections, if you don't have somebody recognize, wait a minute, those infections aren't normal. Those are indicative of a, of a potential breach, right? Because the antivirus is just doing its job in the background, then, then we have a problem, right? We've got to have better visibility into what's occurring on the network and on our machines, on our clients. Then we've got a plan to respond. What, how are we going to respond when the incident occurs? When the inevitable occurs, when we get breached, how are we going to respond? What are we going to do? What steps are we going to take? Like disaster recovery and business continuity, something I've been preaching my entire career. We want to think about these things ahead of time. We don't want to be reactive in the moment. Then we're going to spend a lot of wasted time. And let me tell you, when it comes to a security incident, time is of the essence. The more rapidly you respond, that the less impact you're going to have, the more you're gonna mitigate the damage to your environment. So having thought through those steps and having an active plan in place before an incident is critical to a speedy response. And then we've gotta have that recovery plan in place. How are, once we've had a, a, an incident and we've responded to it and we've cleaned it up and we've mitigated it, how we're going to return back to normal production, normal operations. And most organizations, again, will have a little piece of that in their backup plans and their disaster recovery plans. So they live, they camp out in the protection, they got a little bit of recover, but they kind of ignore the other parts of this pie. Why am I talking about this as we talk about working from home? Because as we go through this presentation, I hope you see that I'm going to apply many of these components 
of the NIST framework to how you need to be thinking about your home employees and your remote employees. So, so I, I still want you to think about this framework, not just at an organizational level, how do we protect our organization and its, its networks, but how do I protect my employees and how do I apply these principles to my remote workers as well? All right, so as an, I'm gonna break this down into really two sections. Um, there's been a lot of presentations about what to do, how to handle remote work, uh, since COVID started because everybody was scrambling around this. A lot of them were extremely high level. They were targeted at these Fortune 100 companies and Fortune 500 companies that have millions of dollars to spend on technology to, to support their remote users. I saw another, uh, another bulk of these presentations that were really targeted at the user, the employee. What can the employee do from home? And I, those, those, we kind of saw those two extremes. So I'm going to try and move to the middle a little bit here. I suspect most everyone on here is part of a smaller organization. You don't have millions of dollars to throw at the problem. So, so what can we do practically within our, our more constrained budgets that still start to meet these goals? And then I'm also going to talk about, I am still going to circle around on the the, the employees and talk about what your employees need to be doing and what your employees need to be thinking about as well. But I'm going to start at the organizational level. All right. So the very first thing I talked about that identify part of the pie. We've got to identify the areas of access. How are our employees working? How are they getting into the environment? Where are they accessing my data from? How are they getting to my applications? Are they logging into my network through some mechanism, whether it's a VPN, whether it's a uh, whether it's some kind of remote solution, are they, how are they getting to the data? I've got to understand that. How are they getting in? And what are the cloud solutions I'm supporting? Cloud solutions are wonderful because they, they give us so much flexibility that I can get to anything from anywhere. So I can go home, I can get to my Office 365 or my G Suite. I might have CRM platforms in the cloud. I might have my finance app in the cloud. I would bet your payroll system is in the cloud, that you're using a cloud-based payroll system. So these are all areas that we want to understand. Where are those points of access that I need to be concerned about? It's I can't just put up a firewall and draw a little boundary around my network and they say, okay, I'm secure because I've got my boundary in place, right? I've got all of these ways of people getting into my systems to get their data to work on their data. And I've got these cloud-based solutions. I need to map this out. All right. Once we've got that map, I need to understand how are my employees getting in, right? Are, are they getting in through a VPN? Are they logging into VPN, my corporate network or my organization network? Are they working through, are they downloading data to their machines locally and then copying it back up at the end of the day? Are they remoting into a system? Are they using Citrix like Bill was talking about, a Citrix remote desktop solution where I really can get to that from anywhere and have full functionality? Are they using something like Splashtop? Splashtop is an application that allows you to run agents on your employees' machines in the office and then they can remote into those uh, from home. So even though they're on a home PC, effectively they're still working in your office environment. That's a great solution. Uh, the, the one caveat I will put on these remote access solutions that I want you to think about as an organization, make sure you are picking a solution that you control or your IT vendor controls, somebody you trust controls. What you don't want to do is have your employees you know, John goes into the office one day and he downloads Go to My PC and he creates an account and he installs it on his PC and then he goes home and logs into the office using My Go to My PC, right? He now has created his own avenue into your environment. We do not want that. We want this to be a a very, very controlled and managed solution so that if something happens. I have control over that access, right? That I want to make sure I've got that control. So you splash top Citrix, these are ways you can maintain that control. VPN, that's a way you can maintain that control. Um, I will say a Microsoft remote desktop server or terminal server, many people still call it, is not secure. Microsoft will be very mad at me for telling you this, but it is true. Please do not stand up a Microsoft remote desktop server and expose it to the internet and tell your employees, here is your app method of access. Those things are breached. Honestly, I've been involved in more breaches where RDP servers exposed to the internet were the cause um, than anything else. 
Most of the breaches actually occur through, through email, but the breaches I have been pulled into have actually been caused by this problem. Um, it is not secure, it will get breached. It is an invitation to an attacker to get into your environment. Now, Microsoft Remote Desktop Protocol is a good technology. It is very handy for remote work, but it needs to be behind another security boundary. So put a VPN in place. So now my employees are logging into a VPN. Once they're connected to the VPN, then they can get to the remote desktop server. That's great. That's fine. That, that's a wonderful solution. I support that. Just don't expose that remote desktop server to the internet. Um, that, that will leave you vulnerable. Okay. So now I've, I know where all of these points of entries are. I know how my employees are working. Now I've got to monitor them. And this really moves into that detect mechanism, right? So now I have to see what is happening at all of these points of entry to make sure that, that nothing is amiss. So how do I do that? Well, one of the simplest things you can do, at least for your organization network, your file servers and your that stuff that your employees are getting off of your network, um, is an intrusion detection system. Um, an intrusion detection system is simply technology typically built into your firewall that's going to monitor the incoming traffic and monitor what's happening. And if it sees something amiss, it can it can send a note out, right? It can alert somebody that something is amiss. And what I mean by something amiss is maybe John goes home and logs in from North Carolina, his home PC every single day, and he's logging into the VPN, that's great. Well, if all of a sudden I see John logging into the VPN from Nigeria or North Korea, right? that's gonna be an indication of a problem. And a good intrusion detection system can, can identify those kind of anomalies. It can also just look at those very directed attacks. Hey, we know they've got Citrix servers. We're gonna try and hit these Citrix servers with these known exploits out here and see if we can try to break into these systems. Those intrusion detection systems will see those types of attacks and the right system can then shut those down. Those sound expensive, they sound fancy, they really are not. Most of the inexpensive commercial grade firewalls now can be bought with these systems built into them. For a couple thousand dollars, you can put a firewall in place that has this technology within it. So, so I put that intrusion detection system in place so you get that monitoring, you get that, that protection. Um, log file retention, and this is a big one for me. I, I see this a lot where, where organizations really don't, don't attend to their log files, they don't watch their log files. Well, those log files track all of the information, all of the connections and all of what's happening on your network. So, so really from the perspective of security, what do I care about? I wanna know who's logging in, when they're logging in, are they logging in successfully? Am I seeing people trying to log in uh, with the wrong password too many times? Um, am I seeing somebody, again, log in from a new location suddenly? Am I seeing somebody who typically works from 7.30, 8 o'clock every day to 5.30, 6 o'clock every day, and suddenly I see them logging in at 2 a.m. every day, right? That would be a real indication that you've got a problem if, if John, who's working from his home in North Carolina is suddenly three days in a row working from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. That's probably a real indicator to me that, that John's account has been compromised and I need to go take some action, right? But, but I'm not gonna see those things unless I'm, I'm capturing those log files and doing some kind of analysis of them. And no, I'm not asking you to go comb through your log files manually and look through the pages of data. There are systems that will do this. Um, I also don't want you to forget about those cloud-based systems, your Office 365s, your CRMs, all of those things that are cloud hosted, you need to monitor those too. You need to watch how, how your employees are interacting with those. We need to see who's logging into those systems, where they're logging in, when they're logging in. We've got to have that information. Most of the cloud-based systems out there have some mechanism to provide that information to you and your IT department can really help you or your vendor can help you collect this information, and put it together so it's meaningful. Some of them are going to, some of them candidly will charge you more money if you want to get that kind of access. Most of them included however so ask them hey how do i how do i track this how do i get this information out of your system so that we can monitor this um and then there at this bottom bullet here security information and event management sim um, sim systems that these do get a little more pricey however 
what a SIM solution is going to do is it's going to take all of this information we've just talked about, your intrusion detection logs and your log files and your Office 365 logs and your VPN logs and your antivirus logs and dump them into a single platform. And it, these systems are designed to do security analytics on that data. And they can tell you when something is amiss. Hey, this is not right. Hey, we're seeing bad things occurring on this particular platform or at this particular gateway into your, into your environment, right? So, so now I've got a system in place that can really collect and, and be used to analyze all of this data I need to be watching. So now, again, let's think about the context of now my employees are all at home. Now I'm not just worried about what's happening on my internal network. Now I'm getting all of the data from them. When are they logging in? When are they coming into my, my corporate network or my organization network? How are they logging in? When are they logging in? What are they doing? But I also have all of the information about how are they interacting with my cloud-based platforms? When are they logging into Office 365? When are they logging into the payroll system? And I can collect all that and watch it so I can really get a heads up if something is wrong. Um, now, unless you have a, your own IT department, and really unless you have a dedicated security employee, this is probably not something you should be doing yourself. The good news is there are lots of third-party monitored SIM solutions out there where they will actually collect and aggregate all of this data for you. They have a 24 by 7 security operations center that is monitoring this data and looking for anomalies and looking for information that maybe is a sign that something's wrong and they will give you a heads up. Hey, there's a problem here. You need to disable this user's account. You need to you know, force a password change for this user. You need to change your firewall rules to block this particular address because it's constantly attacking you, right? There's the, they will see this information and give you a heads up. So unless you can really have the, the manpower or that dedicated person to really constantly watch and be focused on security, leverage one of these third-party tools or these third-party um, solutions. They Yes, they're more pricey than just throwing a firewall in, but I think they are worth it. And they are not so pricey that most organizations cannot enter into that market and make use of their services. So, so investigate those. Um, next, I'm gonna camp out on this one for a few minutes. Uh, Multi-factor authentication. Please, please, please enable multi-factor authentication. You should have MFA set up on any access point into your organizational data. If it is internet facing and somebody can get to my data or get to my organization through whatever it is, I wanna have MFA in place. This means my VPN solution. I wanna have MFA set up on my VPN. So it's not just a password and, a, and an ID and my users into my network, they should be getting an MFA prompt. If it's Citrix, if it's a remote desktop solution, MFA. My cloud-based solutions, Office 365, G Suite. Oh my goodness, please, if you use Office 365 or G Suite and you do not have MFA turned on, I, I beg of you, the first thing you need to do when you, when you are done with this session is email whoever your IT support is and say, what do we need to do to turn on MFA for Office 365 or G Suite? Those are two of the most attacked platforms and MFA just adds a huge layer of protection and aside from getting to the time to set it up it costs nothing it is built into those solutions it is offered to you at no additional cost so please 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 go turn it on but your banks your payroll your crm all of those other cloud-based solutions that we use go to those vendors do you support mfa what are my options around mfa get them to turn it on i, I Definitely think your payroll company should have MFA, your bank should have MFA, CRM, maybe, maybe not. You have to look at the data that's stored in there and how important it is to protect, but certainly your payroll. And if you are using a payroll or a bank that does not have MFA options, I, 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 you really need to start thinking about whether it's time to change platforms or not, because you really do want to have MFA in these areas. So some things to think about with MFA. First of all, security questions are not MFA. MFA is something you know and something you have. I know a password. Now I have to have something. That have can be the code. It can be a phone that is prompted. It can be a phone call that I have to answer. It can be a code off of a little key fob. Those are things I have. It can be a fingerprint. It can be a facial recognition. 
Those are things I have, not things I know. Security questions are just something else I know. And chances are those security questions are stored in the exact same database as the ID and the password. So even if your user has never done anything wrong, if a, a solution you are using gets breached and they get that database, if they get the ID and the passwords, they're also gonna have the answer to those security questions. So that is not MFA, that is not adequate. And a lot of the times, let's face it, when you look at those security questions, those are things while, while maybe they're hard to figure out, most of them are not impossible. What's the name of your dog? Well, I can go to Instagram or Facebook and figure out what the name of somebody's dog is pretty quick. You know, So it's not that hard to get answers to many of those questions. So don't trust security questions and consider them MFA. A lot of platforms use email for MFA. That is a good solution, but it should really be your last option. Um, so I, I'm, I'm gonna walk through a scenario here that we recently saw, and this is directly tied to payroll. So I said a little while ago, 95% of the successful attacks over the past year, few years have occurred or started in email. Well, almost exactly a year ago, I was called into a discussion with one of our clients uh, because they had had their payroll system had been breached and they were trying to figure out how this occurred. Well, it did not take us long to determine that somebody in their finance department who had access to the payroll system and was an administrator in the payroll system got a phishing email. They clicked the link in the phishing email. They got an Office 365 prompt. They thought to get whatever it is this person is sending me, I have to log into Office 365. They put in their email address. They put in their password. They did not have MFA in place, by the way, for Office 365. User hit submit, nothing happened. They didn't think anything of it. They thought, well, this is probably isn't that important anyway. They went about their day. Well, what they had done is they had given an attacker their credentials to Office 365. Almost immediately, somebody was in their email. They started combing through their email. What they start doing is they start looking for, is there information, first of all, is there any information in the email that I want, like social security numbers? Are these people emailing sensitive documents that I want, bank routing information? But they're also going to look for other ways, other information they can use to access the environment. And in this case, what they saw was an email that contained a six digit code to log into the payroll platform, the cloud-based payroll platform. And of course, the name of the payroll platform was within the email. Well, it did not take long for the attacker to create a, a, a folder within the email account that fairly innocuous, I can't remember, they called it archive or something that looked innocuous, something that the, the employee probably was not going to notice. They created a rule in the email so that anything coming from this payroll vendor would immediately get moved into this folder. So now any emails coming in from the payroll vendor, the employee would not see because they were going into the secondary folder, not into the inbox. They then went to the payroll vendor. They, they had a password, right? They've already gotten an ID and a password. So they tried the ID and password. Well, it didn't work, that's good, right? The employee had a different password, but all they had to do was click the, I forgot my password button. And guess what happened? An email got sent back to the employee saying, here's a link to change your password. Of course, that email went into that second folder. They went in, grabbed that link, reset the password. Now they were in their pay. Now they had the next part of the payroll, of the log into the payroll. They went to log in. Oh, we sent you a code back to the email. There's the, there's the code in the email. Put the code into the, into the prompt. They're into the payroll system. They transferred all the money out that was sitting there ready for the next payroll cycle. That did happen, that is a real story. Um, email is a terrible choice for MFA. It, if it is your only option, it is better than nothing, but it is not a good choice. And the reason for that is because so frequently emails are compromised and our email systems get compromised and our employees' email platforms get compromised. So please try not to use email unless you have no other choice. Text messages, phone calls, those are good. Um, lots of systems use SMS. I will say that SMS, there, there have been attacks, successful attacks against SMS in the past for the purposes of getting into sensitive information. Um, bank, a bank in Germany a few years ago had all of their customer data downloaded. 
the attacker managed to clone some of the phones so then they would get the sms messages but that's a very very sophisticated very very difficult attack that the, the chances of that happening are very 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 low yes it is possible very difficult to execute so I, I would not be too concerned about using sms that is a good or text messaging that is a good solution your best solution however are the mobile applications the Google Authenticator, the Microsoft Authenticator, Authy, Duo, those are all MFA-based applications that get installed on your mobile phone, and then they create a keyed connection back to the source. So when that MFA prompt comes in, it is, it is authenticated back to the device. So now even a cloned version of that phone won't have that app, it won't have that, that authenticated connection. The key fobs, the old school key fobs with the rotating numbers, I know they're a pain, but they're great. Those are excellent MFA options. But please consider putting MFA solutions anywhere where you have access into your organizational data that is facing the internet. That, that's a key protection you need to be looking at. And again, I'm going to stress it. If you're on Office 365 or G Suite, please, 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 I'm begging you, go turn it on as soon as humanly possible if you have not. That has solved so many problems for our clients just because of the phishing problem and the way that those systems are attacked. Okay, so let's talk about the endpoints now. So especially if you are considering a long-term solution or you're, you're considering offering your employees the option of working from home, even either part-time or full-time, I, I really want you to think about, let's consider providing them an organizationally owned device. Let's provide them with a laptop if you're going to work from home that's great here's a laptop this is what you work from why why do i want you to do that one because now i own that laptop i own that piece of equipment i can enforce security policies on it i have, i know that their kids aren't going to be playing on it i can push updates to it there's i can encrypt the local data on it so i can enforce my own security policies on that device so i really want you to think about providing that device to your employees that they're going to be working from instead of a long-term plan that that allows them to work from their home computer now if you've got a citrix solution or you're really using a remote desktop solution the home computer is not a bad thing because the home computer really is just a window into the environment. They're not actually working from the home computer. But if you're not on Citrix, if you're if they're working locally, then give them a laptop. Um, that's the best way to do it. If you don't want to give your employees their own device and you don't want to have the cost or the expense of providing everybody with a laptop, then consider providing them the protective software they need. You know, good quality antivirus costs. $45, $50 a year per device. Pay for it and give it to your employees. Say, okay, if you want to work from home, that's fine. Please, it, you, you have to run this good, high quality antivirus software. And the reason I want you to provide it is because what's going to happen when you tell your employee, we expect you to have antivirus software? What's the first thing they're going to do? They're going to go to Google, they're going to search free antivirus, and they're going to download one of these free tools that is far more focused on delivering advertising than it is about protecting the local computer. So give them a quality antivirus solution. Um, or even better, the generation two antivirus or advanced endpoint protection platforms. These really take antivirus to another level and can really turn the device they run on into a little island. So those are even better from a home perspective, because even if I take my laptop into my home network and I've got three other computers on the network, one's my son playing games, one's my husband streaming Netflix, who knows what's happening on these devices even on that same network those advanced endpoint protection platforms will create a little island and protect that device on that same network so those are even better those products are crowdstrike sentinel one um, carbon black those are some examples those are antivirus to another level they do cost a little bit more not tremendously more but they provide a whole additional level of protection so consider that as well um, and then finally if I'm going to be doing this long term, really consider an access control system. It's one thing to say to my employee, OK, you need to be running a supported operating system and you need to be running from a machine that has all the patches on it and you need to be running antivirus and you need to make sure your antivirus is turned on. Well, an access control system can sit at your VPN or sit at your access layer and it can really determine 
are those things in place before I let the connection occur, right? When they log and try to log into the VPN, instead of immediately being let on, there's a little communication between their computer and the access control system that says, okay, what operating system? Okay, you're on a you're on a supported operating system. Okay, you have the current patch. Okay, I see you have antivirus running. Okay, I see your signatures are up to date. All right, I'll let you in, right? And if any of those conditions fail, it will prevent that device from connecting. So again, if you're doing this long term, consider an access control system. A little bit pricey, but not terrible. More than just putting IDS on your firewall, but again, should be affordable, something you can plan for in the long term. But again, making sure that the endpoints themselves are secure and securing the devices that your employees are working from. All right. Now we have got to protect our data. I think this maybe is one of the most complicated things we have seen with users going from home. How is data getting moved in and out of your environment? So, so when my employees are working at home, are they connecting in and then downloading data onto their local PC and then working on it? Are they then copying it back up so that I know it's getting backed up? Are they, or are they forgetting about it and leaving it on their home PC that's not backed up? Are they, uh, how are they actually moving it back in again at the end of the day? Do I have concern that that if I'm my employees working again on a home PC that maybe has its own set of problems, maybe has its own viruses? Is there the potential that I'm going to have data that has been infected moved back onto my corporate network? I don't want that either, right? So, so how is this data moving in and out of my environment? Um, and depending on what kind of data you're dealing with, certainly if you're dealing with PHI, protected health information, uh, you may wanna put limits on whether or not somebody can move that data outside of your organization. Maybe you wanna say this set of data right here that resides in this folder or in this application, you cannot take it outside of our organization. It needs to stay within our security boundary. And you may to make decisions and put limits in place so that that data cannot be moved. That way, you know it's not going to get moved outside. It's not going to get lost because it's sitting on somebody else's PC or laptop. It's it's going to remain protected. It's going to have the virus protection. It's going to get backed up. All of those important things you can ensure are happening if, if you're not allowing it to move outside. So, so these are the things we've got to be thinking about as an organization with our data. But as our my user is moving data in and out of my organization, is it safe? Is it protected? How is that happening? And making sure that data continues to get backed up. And again, it's not just moving in and out of your local file server, it's also your cloud environment. So if we've got Office 365 and we've got SharePoint in place, SharePoint is you know, maybe something we're using as a way for our employees to move data in and out. If that's great, but are we scanning that data as it's coming back in before it goes somewhere else? Are we making sure that if they move it to their local device that it's getting moved back up into the cloud so it can get backed up? Again, just things to be thoughtful of as you plan a long-term remote work strategy. Okay, finally, uh, well, finally on the, the organizational side, train your employees. Uh, we, we talk about 95% of the successful attacks start in phishing. Well, we're not even training our employees what, how to identify phishing, how to, look, how to look for phishing. We're not testing on this. Please, please, please train your employees, test them. Are they getting phished? How is that working? Uh, educate them use one of these phishing simulator platforms and see who is who is liable to click on the links in the email without really looking at it so you can have a conversation with them change the the attitude of your employees so that they are not just click happy and keep in mind again in the remote work model if i've got people working on home pcs it's not just my commercial email it's not just my organizational email they're not just in my exchange or my outlook they're in their own Gmail, they're in their own AOL. And those systems are not gonna have the same levels of protection that maybe I have put on my organizational email. So, so again, I now have this mix of things that potentially could lead to a compromise on a home computer that could potentially lead to a compromise in my organization's environment. So please train your employees, train them not only on phishing, but train them on safe computing practices. You know, one thing, this is, this is faded a little bit in recent months, though we still see some pretty sophisticated attacks, uh, but unfamiliar websites taking advantage of the COVID paranoia, right? There were lots of maps being offered that were saying, here's your latest COVID infection map. And when you connected to the website, it would say, here, you need to download this plugin to view our map. Well, 
you didn't need to download a plugin and what they were actually downloading was malware, right? So, so really train your employees on how to be cautious and be safe on the internet and, and, and make sure that they understand how to identify phishing, that they know, even if I get an email from somebody I know, if I'm not expecting this attachment or if they're sending me something that looks odd based on who that my relationship is with that person, I need to ask a question. Really, we've got to do a better job of training our employees. Please, I, I beg of you, please train your employees in this area. Uh, and, and a real quick statistic here, annual training is not enough. Um, there's been lots of studies that have been done that show that, that when we train our employees in cybersecurity, they're, they, they're kind of at, at their their best for about 90 days, and then they start to lapse into old behaviors. So if we're only training them for once a year, then really nine months out of the year, we're at a high level of risk. Um, this does not mean you have to put your employees through day-long, hour-long, rigorous cybersecurity training every quarter, but just things that are constantly keeping at top of mind, constantly reminding them, a short video, an email that talks about cybersecurity and what they can do. It doesn't have to be long and complicated, just something that keeps it relevant and keeps reminding them of the importance. So please train your employees. All right. Next, I'm going to move on to what can your employees do? So, so this is what you can communicate to your employees and say, okay, as you go work from home, here are the things I would like you to consider and you to do. Um, first of all, secure their home computers, right? If they're running on a home computer and they're using that as their main work platform while they're at home, encourage them. Look, you need to be on an updated operating system. You need to have, it has to have support. Please make sure it's getting patches regularly. Make sure your web browser is patched. You know, make sure Chrome, Opera, pick your web browser of choice. All of them have vulnerabilities in them that get patched on a regular basis. Encourage your employees to know how that patching is done. Figure it out based on the browser their preference. Go to the vendor's website and get those patches applied regularly. Make sure their Windows operating system, their desktops, their laptops, their, their mobile devices are getting patched on a regular basis so that they stay secure. And again, install or update your antivirus software and make it a quality antivirus solution. Not Don't go download one of the free ones. That's not adequate. Get a quality antivirus software. Again, as an organization, I'm going to encourage you to do this for them. Take this decision away and say, hey, here's some good high quality antivirus. We're going to provide it to you. But again, if you're worried about that cost, worried about that expense, at least encourage them or make it a mandate that they have to run a good high-end antivirus platform on their or software on their computer. All right, they need to secure their networks. So routers and firewalls. Most of us at home, we went to Best Buy or the AT&T guy came out and he set up a device or we took it out of the box and we plugged it in and we went through the little walkthrough that told us how to get it running and we've never thought about it again. Uh, like everything else, these devices have vulnerabilities on them. Actually, right about the same time COVID started, there were some Linksys firmware issues that were very significant that really allowed uh, Linksys devices to be compromised. So, so we've got to update the firmware on those devices. And, and those aren't complicated processes. It's just a matter of logging into the device, going to a page, saying, update my firmware. Every single vendor has instructions on how to do this on their website. Encourage your employees to go do that and make sure those devices are up to date and secure. Change the default admin password. You can go to Google right now and search default admin and admin credentials for a D-Link firewall, and you're going to find them because every single D-Link out of the box is going to have the same credentials. So, so encourage your employee to log into the device and change that administrative password so that it's not the default. Make sure remote management is disabled. Now, the good thing here is most of these devices are set this way by default out of the box. And what I mean by remote management is to get into the management of my firewall or of my, my Wi-Fi router, I've got to be on the back side of it. I can't get to it from the internet. Don't you, you don't want to allow that, that management interface to be exposed to the internet. Most of them are, are enabled that way. Sometimes people go and change that because they want the convenience of begin getting being able to get onto the device remotely, but please encourage them to make sure that's disabled as well. And again, go to the vendor's website and, and look for this information and you will find out how to do all of these things. Um, next, update all of the internet connected devices in your home. Right? It's not just the router and the firewall. You've got your Google Nest. We got our Amazon Alexas. We got our security systems. We got our, we got our, our 
AC controls are internet connected, we got our smart toasters. And that's a little bit of a joke, but there is actually a smart toaster out there, right? Everything in our home is internet connected these days. So we've got to make sure that they're updated to remain secure as well. Or somebody could get onto one of those systems, again, get onto a PC that's in the home, potentially get onto a PC that's being used to access your organizational data. So get those things updated as well. And then I really want to encourage my employees, make sure as you do work, you're backing the data up again, that you're not just leaving it sitting on your home PC, that you're copying it back into our network. You're connecting to the VPN and putting it back on the file server. You're putting it back on OneDrive or SharePoint. Maybe you use G Suite, you're putting it on the Google Drive. Maybe you use Citrix ShareFile, Box, Dropbox. Any of these are good options. Again, kind of like the remote access software, if you wanna use you know, Google Drive or Dropbox, make sure it's a, a commercial version of that so that your organization owns it and controls it. Um, not just that you're telling your employee, hey, go sign up for a Dropbox account, copy the data out there, that's not what you want. But there are ways to do this as an organization so that you can use these as convenient platforms, to make sure your data is, is staying someplace in the cloud is getting backed up, that there are copies available so that if somebody's PC crashes or gets infected, your data is not lost. So really encourage your employees to be mindful of your data and how they handle it and what they do with it and make sure it is being, being put someplace where it is going to continue to get backed up. All right. Um, finally, with our employees, encourage them to communicate suspicious activity. This is so critically important. Again, I talked, I gave you the example of the payroll breach. You know, one thing we really want to see is if somebody, if you have a situation like that, if you click on a link and it just doesn't work the way it's supposed to, or you think this should be taking me to a document, it didn't. I thought I just logged into Office 365, but I'm not in Office 365. They've got to tell somebody because again, when it comes to security incidents, incident, incidents the faster you respond, the better off you are. So we got to encourage them to do this so that they will will tell somebody so we can go see is there a real issue do we need to take action or was this just noise and, and meaningless i would much rather have an employee email me and say or or call me and say hey i, I i'm looking at this email i don't know if this is legit or not and i could spend 30 seconds determining whether that email is legit or whether it's fake that's 30 seconds well spent even if it's good, good. no, nope, that's that's a Macy's ad, you're fine. No, that's malicious, don't click on that link. You know, that takes 30 seconds of my time. If they click on that link, I could be in for months of recovery. And that is no joke, months of recovery, simply because somebody clicked on a bad link in an email. So please encourage your employees to be cautious, but also when things look amiss, when things aren't working right, when things just seem like they're off, that's a good time to go, what's happening here? You don't want them to be paranoid, but you want them to communicate. Hey, this email is not look right. I went to this website and it did something funny. It started playing a video I was not expecting, whatever it is, right? But just if it's suspicious, have them let somebody know so you can validate that no damage has been done. Okay, final slide here. Um, secure the computers, the endpoints themselves, make sure you got security on your network, provide high quality remote access solutions. So not an RDP server sitting on the internet, but some mechanism that is secure, put multi-factor authentication in place, make sure you've got backup strategies in place for your data, communicate suspicious activity. And the final one, I haven't said this yet, but be click cautious, not click curious. We've got to move the mindset to being more, more open to, wait a minute, what is that? Instead of just clicking on everything that comes in. Um, I hope you found this information helpful. Uh, if you have questions, please contact VC3. And here's some contact information. You can email me directly and I will turn it over to Bill to see if we have any questions. Joe, thank you so much. All I can say is, wow. I was taking notes the whole time and thinking, okay, I've got to check on this. And I remember this kind of scam trying to go through and how we had to stop this and do that. Um, your story in regard to the payroll, um, the theft of the payroll was just amazing to me and how they wormed their way in through the email, made the dummy accounts, and then were able to change the password and withdraw all those funds that were in that account. That should scare everybody in regard to that level of security or not having that level of security and what can happen um, 
to anybody. So thank you for that story. That was just absolutely incredible. Um, there are a couple of questions from the audience I'd like to uh, bring out to you. The first one is, what are your thoughts about other paid solutions like remote PC? Um, all You've got to look at every single one of them. You've got to look at the pros and cons. Uh, remote PC, again, not, not bad. All of those are these cloud, but they're, that's really a similar to Splashtop, which I talked about, or GoToMyPC, which is a Citrix solution. All of those are paid solutions. They all have security features. Go look at them, evaluate their security features. But most importantly, the most important thing I want to say is, do you maintain control? Right. You don't want to put a solution in place where your employees are basically controlling their own access to your environment. It's got to be a centrally managed platform that you create the accounts. You can manage the accounts. You can cut somebody off if necessary. You've got to be the one that maintains that control. Nothing wrong with the solutions. They're fine. Just make sure you're maintaining the control. And I think one thing that gets overlooked a little bit on some of those solutions, do you have the ability to control data leaving your network? If that's important to you, make sure, you know, if we've got PHI in our network and we want to make sure that nobody can copy that out, make sure the solution supports no data transfers. The second question I have here is, how do we integrate fingerprint authentic um, authentication? So, uh, well, that, that's a loaded question. There's, there's lots of different ways to do that, depending on the solution, depending on the platform, depending on whether you're talking about a cloud solution, depending on whether you're talking about a, a local solution. Um, you know, most, most, of the, most of the phones now, the newer phones, have some sort of fingerprint scanner on them. Um, a lot of the laptops, if you're selective with laptops, a lot of the laptops can come with a fingerprint scanner on them as well. Outside of that, if you want to do fingerprint authentication, then you're really looking at a third party device, a USB device that plugs into a computer that can do a fingerprint scanner. Or if, you, if you're willing to have your employees use their mobile devices, you can tie it to the MFA. So you can have an MFA solution that, that says, okay, you're trying to log in. I'm now going to prompt you on your phone for your multi-factor authentication, and I'm gonna rely on your fingerprint on your phone as that, that authentication attempt, right? So you can kind of get around that a little bit by, by integrating your mobile device into your MFA platform. And then you've got programs like HID have you know, access control programs that are built on fingerprint and smart card authentication. Those get pretty pricey though, um, but, but you've really got to look at the different solution and look at what you're trying to control access to. Okay, uh, third question here for you. Um, what is the estimated cost for an assessment from a firm like DC3? Well, good question. Uh, uh, for, for typically for smaller organizations, if I'm and when I say smaller organizations, I'm saying 50 to 100 users smaller. Uh, we can typically do a security analysis for somewhere between four thousand, fifty-five hundred dollars, sort of depending on the size of your environment. Um, it's a one-time engagement; it takes a couple months. Um, now we focus, and I'll trying not to be VC3 salesy here, so I apologize, but we focus very much on the processes. We want to look at not just, we want to look at the technologies you have and the processes you have and are they effective. What we are not interested in doing is coming and doing a suite of security scans and handing you a list of 5,000 things that are wrong in your environment saying, okay, here's a list of you to go fix. We want to determine more do you have a fundamental basis for security versus the latter. Um, there are lots of security organizations that will charge you a lot more for an assessment. They're probably going to do more. They are going to do that scan and that assessment. So uh, weigh what your options are and what you're looking for. VC3 will do that. We try again, we try to focus not just on the technology, but are you a secure organization? Do you have pro secure processes in place as well? Um, Joe, I've got one more question. This one's from me, actually. And I have a number of staff folks, and every so often one of those uh, fishing expeditions happens. And I have had um, staff members who have pressed on those, um, yeah. Um, and then they say, oh my God, what did I do? And then we end up calling VC3 right away and blah, blah, blah. Um, I would love to have that little test you mentioned just to put something out there to see in my office who, after all the training we went through a year ago, two years ago, 
who forgot that you're not supposed to be pressing on that kind of thing if they don't recognize it and how to realize that no before you do anything why don't you call that person and ask them if they actually sent you something so something like that to me as a training tool would be very very interesting could you speak to it just a little bit about that yeah, certainly. We're seeing a lot of platforms now that do this because it is such a significant risk. Probably the most well-known one out there, the one that most people have heard of, is a product called NoB4. K-N-O-W-B-E number four. Um, that's probably one of the most most popular kind of security training and phishing simulation platforms out there. Very mature. I will be honest, I think from the from their training content, I don't love all their training content. It's a little dry, it's a little sterile. I think some of the newer players out there have, have better content, more engaging content, um, but no before has got just a very mature platform. Get Curricula, um, they're a company that started out of Atlanta. I've seen some of their demo videos, some of their training videos, they're fantastic. They're entertaining so that as you're training your employees, you can be, you can ensure that they're actually paying attention to what they're watching instead of checking out and doing something else at the same time. Um, but there's a lot of platforms out there, but that's just two. Um, you know, almost every major security vendor is now integrating some kind of training. Webroot has training platforms. Um, ID Agent has training platforms. There, there's a lot of them out there, but no before is probably the most popular. Great. Um, Joe, I really want to thank you for spending time with us today and sharing your expertise. In addition, I want to thank VC3 overall and Sandy Reese for your, you're just being great partners to NATO as well as my organization and other RDOs um, throughout the country. So thank you for that. We appreciate it greatly. Um, and um, if I could give you a round of applause, I would, but you were wonderful, thank you. Thank you all very much. Everyone have a great afternoon, have a great day. Great, I wanna let everybody else know who's on here that uh, there'll be a break until 3.15, in which time it will be followed up by two more breakout sessions. The first one is on Braun Fields and it's called on the road to redevelopment and we'll be meeting in this room um, and then the RDO, um, it was a um, continuity of operations will be in room B. So that being said, thank you all very much. I enjoyed this um, and it was always a pleasure to be of service to NATO. Thank you once again, Joe.